but Israel is really good. They've done a better job at PR than the Nazis ever did. They've been able to sell genocide. Um, and they've been able to sell that um, before October 7th, there were 5,000 prisoners in Israeli, uh, and, and I think most of them children, in Israeli prisons without charges. And now, uh, since then, there are 9,000. Um, and the, the goal is to um, undermine uh, any sense of community in the Palestinian uh, families. Uh, you traumatize people, uh, you get them questioning their neighbors. Uh, I mean, there's a there's a concerted effort to make sure that uh, the society falls apart. And that's, that's the softness of their uh, trying to eradicate these people. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Spath. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, co-chair of ICAD USA, and member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ. At the beginning of February, Doug Thorpe, Mark Braverman, Don Wagner, and I put out a nationwide call for the Stones Cry Out delegation to Palestine and Washington, D.C., February 26th to March 6th. There's a slide of the uh, uh, sponsoring organizations. So take a look at them and we're very, very grateful for each one. 23 church leaders and activists from 12 denominations dropped everything they were doing. And within three weeks, our delegation met in Bethlehem, six days in Palestine, 17 meetings in four and a half days in Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Ramallah, and Hebron then back to D.C. for two intensive days of congressional meetings and actions. <laughs> we produced a report from our delegation. You can Four of the delegation members are with us today, and here they are. Sus Susan Brooksbank is a retired businesswoman, an elder in a Presbyterian church, and you can read about Susan here. Joanne Quinn is an oncology nurse and a member of Kairos Puget Sound. Ashley Weist Laird is pastor at First Baptist Church, Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts, and has worked at Sabeel and the Middle East Council of Churches in Jerusalem. Jack Erskine has served 40 plus years as a priest in the Episcopal Church and eight years as a chaplain. And uh, in addition to this delegation, Jack and his wife, Christy, also a priest, an Episcopal priest, visited Pal uh, Gaza in 2019. So, uh, Susan, Joanne, Ashley, and Jack, welcome. Thanks. Thank you, Thanks. Michael. We uh, uh, had 17 meetings, like I say, in four and a half days. We'll get a chance to share much more, but I'd like I'd like for each one of you, uh, if you don't mind, to share the one visitor experience that stands out in your mind as the most impactful, the one that you really wanted to tell when you got back home. And why don't we just start with you, Susan? Um, yeah, I had a feeling that would be one question. Um, <laughs> I think for for me, it was going to Hebron and uh, talking with Isa. I forget his last name. Um, and and then seeing after talking with him and hearing about his um, detainment and torture and takeover of his house. Um, the other thing that was so impactful was as we were coming back through the town, there was a horde of. Uh, settlers coming through the town with an equal number of soldiers with their guns um, parading through the town and going from one kind of entrance to another point, I think going to the, the, the Israeli side of the settlement and in Hebron, and just that, that massive incursion just then with the soldiers and the soldiers on the rooftops with their kind of guns sort of pointing at us not quite but um that that was just chilling and kind of it was just chilling it was it was disturbing very disturbing 
Uh, Joanne? Yeah, it's uh, impossible to uh, just zero in on one of the meetings we had. Um, I second what Susan said about uh, the walk through Hebron. It was it was uh, chilling. It was really awful. And um, the uh, day we spent with Tent of Nations and Daoud and Daher and Amal Nasser uh, was such a beautiful setting on his farm and to see two, uh, we think settlers just walk right by us uh, on his private property, completely unabashed with uh, their weapons strapped to them. And uh, Amal said to them and Daoud said, you know, this is private property. Um, and they said, oh no, all this is ours, waving their hands. Uh, uh, what what can you say to that? One other um, experience I recommend that everybody on the webinar um, Google uh, Father Munther Isaac, the pastor of the uh, Christmas Lutheran Church in Bethlehem. He appeared in London uh, and gave a beautiful speech. Uh, and he also gave a speech that went viral, a homily at Christmas time about Christ under the rubble. And um, he he met with us. He asked, among many questions he had for the West, uh, he said, where are the churches? You know, we're abandoned and we feel um, forsaken. And, uh, you know, you just think uh, how safe it is. Uh, churches and leaders like to play it safe. And... Um, in a situation like this, um, that reveals where people stand. And I think of a theologian who said, the church is the cross on which Christ was crucified in this in this instance. Uh, Thank you, it has Joanne. to change. Thank you. Ashley? Well, I'll um, pick up that point. Um, and just a hello to uh, folks on this call, I just want to uh, acknowledge that, that there are people on this call that I see uh, who uh, could speak to these realities um, firsthand. Um, just want to say I want to shout out to Cedar to um, uh It's good to see you. Um, I think the hardest thing for me, the most impactful thing was um, actually a private conversation that I had with someone, a Palestinian Christian who um, in the course of the conversation said to me, you know, this is, this is the worst experience of our lives. And, you know, to, as Joanne said, not only do we feel abandoned, but it feels as if the masks have fallen off and we see who really stands with us yeah. um, and who only, uh, who only, you know, talks a good game, um, but who's not really in the hard moments willing to, to stand in solidarity with us. Um, so we heard that, didn't we, Ashley, that uh, they say we, we now know who our friends are. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. Yeah. Jack? And we now know who our friends aren't. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I could um, I could echo what everybody said, except except for Ashley didn't have that private con conversation. Um, and to sort of talk a little bit about what Susan said, um, it was incredibly chilling. Uh, and I was able to take a photograph of a Palestinian, I would call it 10 year old on a bike riding up to the soldiers. And uh, as uh, the Arabic speaking folks in our group said, he's just saying, I'm just a kid, I'm just a kid. Um, and that was, I, the irony there was incredible. The 10 of nations was, uh, was chilling as well. Um, and to think of Munther saying, uh, it, this was one that hit me really hard, being a church person. Um, <laughs> when I was hungry, you gave me a statement. Uh, when I was in prison, you gave me a statement. Um, we'd just been giving statements and uh, not doing anything. And most of the statements have been in support of Israel. So um, I think the... The major thing that came through to me over and over again by all the folks we talked to was that um, the Gaza is it's horrific. Gaza is indeed horrific. The goal is the West Bank to try and take control of the West Bank. 
Um, and that was that was news to me, and and it, it made great sense given the system that is uh, oppressing the Palestinian people. So. Thanks for that, Jackie. I want to come back to that in a little bit because we heard that again and again and again, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, Su Susan, Joanne, um, Sabil's uh, Omar Harami walked us through the East Jerusalem neighborhood of Silwan, where Israel's destroying houses to build the City of David theme park. We met outside the destroyed home of Fakri Abu Diab, the leader of the Silwan Neighborhood Association whose house was destroyed, what, a couple of weeks earlier on Ash Wednesday, Valentine's Day, because of his activism. Joanne, uh, Susan, your reactions to that visit and Fakhri's comments with us through Omar's translation. Joanne? Um, my reaction is I'm in awe of that man. He had such dignity and grace and the first words out of his mouth were, thank you for coming. You have no idea how it comforts us and gives us strength and courage. Um, I, 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 I had no words for the spirit of the Palestinian people. He in, in, embodied the Samud of Palestinian people. Susan? Susan, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, I, uh, you know, as, as Joanne's talking, it makes me want to cry. I mean, I just, the, here's this very, um, you know, he's he was very formal. He looked educated. He was, I, I mean, it was just, there was no reason other than the fact that he was a spokesman for Palestinian, for Palestinians in Silwan, that he was a spokesman for them, that they were retaliating against him. There was, it's not like sometimes you hear in the West Bank in, in, in Area C, you hear these fake reasons, which are, oh, you're, you built without a, a permit, which they can't get, you can't get a permit. So you get, you get these um, demolition um, rulings. He didn't even have that. They just came in and demolished his home. And, and the thing that's scary about that is the whole Silwan, we were looking at the whole town and he was saying that the whole town is, the whole the whole neighborhood is slated for demolition. The entire neighbor, it's it's huge. And it, and just uh, because they're Palestinian, I, I, don't, I don't, how do you <laughs> justify that? How do you, and this is, this is our tax dollars doing this. We stood on the hillside overlooking the the hill, right, where all the, the neighborhood is built. And we saw homes uh, slated for destruction. Yeah. Um, Ashley and Jack, let me address this one to you. Uh, we heard from many, uh, Jack, you just mentioned it, about this slow motion genocide. Uh, a soft genocide is how Rifat Cassis put it, right? This slow motion genocide happening in the West Bank, even though our eyes are rightly turned to Gaza. Can you share with us uh, um, some of those, uh, uh, some of the evidence that we experienced of this slow motion genocide in the West Bank, Jack and then Ashley? Um, I think that this is the 1930s all over again. Uh, but Israel is really good. They've done a better job at PR than the Nazis ever did. Uh, they're not, they've been able to sell genocide. Um, and they've been able to sell that. Um, I guess the, the one that struck me was uh, somebody saying uh, before there were um, 5,000 people, before October 7th, there were 5,000 prisoners in Israeli uh and, and I think most of them children in Israeli prisons without charges. And now uh, since then there are 9,000. Um, and the, the goal is to um, undermine uh, any sense of community in the Palestinian uh, families. Um, 
you traumatize people, uh, you get them questioning their neighbors. Uh, I mean, there's a there's a concerted effort to make sure that the, the society falls apart. And that's that's the softness of their uh, trying to eradicate these people. We see the hard evidence, don't we? Buildings, uh, the famine, the bombings, the, the killings. But there's, as you said, there's this undercurrent of of the breakdown of communities and families that this is that 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 this agenda is all about, right? It's it's systemic. It's I mean the the um, the plan that that uh, the Israeli government has is 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 pretty um, pretty vile and uh, pretty pretty damn effective. Ashley, thank you, Jeff. I mean, I think all of this, you know, can be, you know, you can look back at the documents from 1948 and, and prior and, and see the plan um, uh, that has uh, just is just going forward um, since that time of plan for ethnic cleansing um, to remove the people uh, from the land so that they can be replaced. And I think, um, you know, the settlements certainly within uh, the West Bank are a good example of that kind of slow um, that slow ethnic cleansing when you have settlements that continue to grow and grow and grow. Um, you know, there are, what, 800,000 um, or so Israeli settlers living in uh, living in the West Bank in contravention of international law, which, of course, makes it impossible for Palestinian cities and towns to grow and expand. And so then you have uh, folks from, you know, where do they go? Where do they build homes? And that kind of slower process, if you will, of ethnic cleansing, then certainly. Uh, Ashley, we're having trouble. Just the here. week after, I guess, the during the week we were there. Oh, Ashley, you're breaking up Can on you us. Hear me? We're really having trouble hearing you. Your connection. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Okay. If I turn my video off now, can you hear me? Yes, okay. that's great. So um, just that that increasing, uh, the increasing settlements. Uh, after we were there, there was an announcement of 3,500 new settlements, um, new uh, houses to be built in the settlements and um, homes for, you know, Jewish only um, folks. And I think, Again, there's no room for expansion for Palestinian communities, um, as well as uh, not just within the settlements, but so much of the land is then occupied. Um, and, and so you see that these into smaller areas, um, you know, and, and that gradually, of course, perpetuates, um, you know, an ethnic cleansing. Oh. Ashley, I'm going to ask some other people some questions. You may want to uh, uh, go out and come back in because you're still breaking up on us. So uh, uh, I'm sorry about that. I'll try again. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, Michael, Jack, let me, uh, can I? Um, yeah, go ahead, Jack. Sure. Just to add to what Ashley was saying, it, uh, when we were there in 2019, we went to Hebron, uh, went into the hills to a um, it was almost like a Bedouin community. Their their houses there had been demolished three times. Uh, they'd been demolished, built, demolished, built. Um, a Mercedes drove through the camp on its way to the settlers um, right next to them. I mean, it was, I mean, back then, I think it speaks again to what Ashley's talking about. This has been 75 years of this. And yet, uh, in the last you know five months, it's intensified greatly. Jack, I was going to thank you for that. I was going to come back to you. Uh, you had the distinction. Uh, I mean, a number of us had uh, in our delegation had been to Gaza, but mine, my gosh, is 18, 19 years ago. You and Christy were the last people from our group to have traveled to Gaza in 2019. Talk up to us uh, a little bit about the impact of the delegation on you and Christy. I mean, you showed me a, a comparison of pictures at one point that you saw in the news with pictures right. you had. 
Uh, but the the impact that the, uh, of this particular trip that uh, on you and Christy, given Israel's genocide now in real time in Gaza. I I think one of the things that strikes me the most is the the very day we went into Gaza the first. Uh, well, let me back up a little bit. Um, going through the Erez checkpoint and. Um, in Israel, the Israel side was uh, like going through a ger German um, blockade. Going through the Hamas checkpoint was like going through um, Native Americans getting ready to try and search your bags and see what's going on. I mean, those are the differences. The intent was the same on both, uh, to intimidate you, and to make sure that you uh, felt scared. Um, we hadn't been in Gaza for more than, uh, I'd say a couple of hours. And we talked to uh, Sahela who works at Al Ali Hospital. And uh, she was telling us that 80% um, of the people in Gaza do not support Hamas, but Hamas governs them. Um, and I, I just found that incredible. And then given the fact that we're there now, um, a month ago, realizing that uh, Hamas does what they did on October 7th, and all those people we met are, um, most of them are probably not still alive um, yeah. as a result. And they were, they didn't support the folks that uh, took action in their, on their behalf, so to speak. And now the retaliation is, is uh, killing them. I think the the one, I, I love analogies. The one analogy that struck me as we talked in our delegation was, I can't remember the person who said it was, it would be as if a Kentucky shooter took hostages in a, a uh, elementary school and somewhere in Kentucky and the FBI decided to bomb it in order to just get the shooter. Um, and that's what's happening in Gaza. Um, just to get a few shooters, we're, we're murdering, uh, I don't know how many th thousands of people. It's over 30,000 now. And I think I read last week, uh, there were probably 11,000 unaccounted for. Yeah. So, um, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Ashley, you, uh, You've lived there, you've worked there, you've led trips there. Was there something, I mean, I'm sure there were may, maybe maybe many things, but was there something in particular that was new that you saw and learned this trip or that you experienced that really seared itself into your uh, consciousness? And that's a good question. Um, I think... Uh, I don't know if I want to say that there was something new. I think it's just everything is just elevated um, in a way that I haven't seen before. Um, I think one of the things that we've seen over the last five months that I've never seen that that may be new that I've never seen before is the kind of um, the way that the, the fact that Israel has bombed Janine. Um, now, that didn't happen, you know, that's not while we were there, but just that kind of uh, level of um, and the bulldozers that are going in and ripping up um, infrastructure in the refugee camps um, in Janine and Tokaram. I think that to me is a new level um, that I don't think that I've ever seen before um, in 30 years um, where, um, you know, they've always done this to Gaza <laughs> um, and gotten away with that. But I feel like now we're kind of into a new um, a new level of violence in the West Bank as well. Um. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, Susan and Joanne, uh, you were co-authors of the delegation report. I mean, we all weighed in. We all have our fingers on it. And we all signed it. But uh, Susan, it, it begins with a quote from Palestinian-American businessman uh, Sam Bahor, who we met with in Ramallah. He pulled no punches. And he said, and by the way, the report repeats this a number of times, this is a U.S. war. I mean, he almost started his talk with us with that. Why, why did you and Joanne decide to begin the report that way, with that quote?
Susan, you're uh, muted. <laughs> Duh, college educated. Um, one of the things that uh, he said as well was nothing has changed and kind of ties in with what Ashley just said. Nothing has changed and everything has changed as well. So, I mean, he, he was, um, he was very vocal about that. In fact, I was just reading, going back and reading through my notes on what he said. He said, um, the, I'm not answering your question, am I? I think what, what was critical to me is in his view and why we wanted to put it in there is because it is a U.S. war. He said, military officials say that if the U.S. did not support us, Mil Israeli military officials are saying if if the U.S. did not support us, we could not continue. And Sam said, this is what U.S. policy and Israeli impunity looks like, this genocide. Um, it's so powerful. It's such a powerful statement that I I, I think it, it kind of says it all right now. Um, it says it, it for U.S. citizens, what we need to hear. This is, we need to be paying attention to, you know, our policies and, and who are we killing? U.S. money, U.S. weapons, U.S. Uh, vetoes in the U.N., right? I mean, uh, we can't, this isn't, we, we're outsourcing our war, really, uh, is, uh, was his message. He Join said. Her. Yeah, oh. go ahead, Susan. Go ahead, Susan. Let me, I'll just write down that there are some points. He said, call out the genocide, call out U.S. for being on the wrong side of history over time. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to hold politicians accountable, like what is happening in Michigan, all the way down to the state and local level. Um, funding, uh, we need to be pushing on uh, U.S. government to fund UNRWA and provide funding for Palestine. He wants people to be in solidarity. They need to see Palestinian person in the flesh. Um, so those were some of the things that he talked about. Um, and, and he strongly said, yes, this is a U.S. war. I think I think Munther said the same thing. Well, we heard. Yes, that's right. We heard this. And Joanne, I'm going to come to you now. We keep hearing this from a number of our uh, of our uh, the people who are hosting us. Right. That uh, the action needs to take place. I mean, they were appreciative that we came, but but we have work to do then when we get back home. And they were especially critical of the current administration, weren't they? So, Joanne, let me uh, follow up. The report ends. It begins with Sam talking about the U.S. war. It ends with you all recounting the protest self-immolation of Aaron Bushnell. And you you wrote the words that he spoke. I'm not going to read all of them. But uh, uh, compared to what people have been experiencing in Palestine at the hands of their colonizers, what he's doing is not extreme at all. This is what our ruling class has decided what will be normal. And then as he was dying, inflamed, free, free Palestine. So just as Susan shared why it was important to begin with Sam's words, why did you all think it was so important to end with Aaron Bushnell's uh, 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 experience and his uh, his statement, his story. Is uh, Joanne? We can't hear you. No, we can't hear you. So we somehow we lost your audio. Okay, can you hear this? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, yeah, my none of my ear pods or my two hundred and fifty dollar uh <laughs> iPod Max Pros work. Um yeah. Uh well about Aaron Bushnell, the uh Air Force young man who um immolated himself at the embassy. Um I, when we went through Washington DC, I actually uh, visited that sacred spot where he, where he died and where there's a shrine to him now. Um, an act like that is not uh, a solitary act. There's a long history of these um, acts uh, 
happening um, uh, during the Vietnam War, during the Velvet Revolution in um, the former Yugoslavia and um, other incidences in, in Egypt um, during the Arab Spring. So these acts have the power to mobilize uh, large groups of people who uh, take action thereafter. Um, the situation that Sam Bahor described um, where nothing has changed and everything has changed. Um, in many ways, um, this is just, writers have um, written how this is just an ongoing Nakba since 1948. Um, and it's, there, there are flare ups and, um, you know, peaks and troughs in the um, pattern. But uh, I don't know that anybody could have predicted the response uh, that uh, Israel has uh, rained down on uh, the people of Gaza after October 7th. Um, there's a, a quote by uh, Miko Peled, and he said, this is what they've wanted to do all along, and now they're just finishing the job. I always felt when I visited Israel and Palestine that if a mass... Um, I have to say it, uh, genocide or um, ethnic cleansing or um, uh, displacement could, if the world would let Israel get away with it, they they would do it. And, and now the world is letting them get away with it. Um, uh, one last point, um, on my prior trips to the West Bank, I have never been to Gaza. Um, but in the West Bank, there was always there were always a lot of tourists because it's the Holy Land. There was um, more of a buoyant atmosphere. A lot of visitors, Palestinians, um, are happy to were happy to see us. Um, you know, we're helping their economy, and they're just gracious, hospitable people. But th this time in Bethlehem and uh, Jerusalem, there was very quiet. There really aren't any tourists. The West Bank is kind of locked down and etched on the faces of ordinarily resilient people was just a, a type of uh, stress, strain, despondency, and I dare say despair. This is, this is really too much what's being done from pure revenge on their brethren in the West, in Gaza. Um, these are war crimes and... Let's hope we can we can stop them. Thank you. Michael, can I just throw in two real quick things? Please. If you don't mind. One is that almost everybody that we visited with mentioned Aaron Bushnell as well. Um, and as his a courage. Hero. As, a, as hero. a hero. As a hero, as someone um, uh, that had courage and willingness to stand up for um for for hurting people and for and for the values um, that he believed in. And um and then the second piece about that around uh, the tourism is that, you know, one of the things I heard as well was that that the only people that they'd really seen coming, um, especially Americans, were people who were coming to do solidarity visits with Israelis and going into the settlements. Um, That's right. That's right. And, That's and right. to offer solidarity to the Israeli settlers. And so that was the Palestinians experience of, of the people who'd been there because there had really been we were the second group i think that in the, the presbyterians had a group that went a week ahead of us and then we were the group and maybe the first group in hebron that people had seen um since october um and so i think that also contributed to that abandonment feeling um that we spoke of earlier yeah there was there were three or four uh there were three or four uh meetings that we had who said that we were the first people to visit them since october the 7th I want to I want to move on uh, uh, and ask each one of you to comment on this. I thought one of the most impactful meetings that we had was with Adam Balukas from the from UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Works Agency, and I, I want to just get your reactions, your brief reactions to that meeting. Uh, Ashley, would you start, and then Jack, then Joanne, then Susan. I always feel when when anyone in an institutional position like 
like the UN or any kind of government position, um, stops talking with diplomatic speak and just gets right to the core of things and talks about how his colleagues are being killed and the um, and just the oppression and um, and and horrors that are happening. Um, you know that something's really shifted. Um, and that's what he did. He just got right into it and talked about how terrible it was and how the funding loss of funding was going to impact him, them, you know, the everything that they do. And um, that was that was impactful. We were expecting we were we, we, we were expecting diplomat speak, weren't we? And we sure didn't get that. Yeah. Jack. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I, I'm just struck by uh, the good people at UNRWA. Um, I was impressed with Adam, uh, but it it brought back memories in Gaza. We went to see the UNRWA executive there, who uh, at the time I believe was a person from the Netherlands, um, and he was incredibly calm, incredibly insightful. Uh, he did the same thing. There wasn't any kind of polished speech. Uh, this is a guy who, who was running 450 schools in Gaza, uh, making sure that uh, people got fed. Um, and he he was doing it in the face of uh, the Trump cuts to uh, the same sort of deal. Uh, Trump cutting the UMRA uh, budget. Um, and I... I know it's that's I think for me one of the most discouraging parts is realizing that uh UNRWA is, is doing incredible work and and we uh we destroy it. Joanne. Joanne, you're muted. Okay, so sorry. Um can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so yes, meeting with uh, Adam Belukos in Jerusalem at the UNRWA headquarters for the West Bank was uh, one of our early visits and it was it kind of set the tone for the week. I agree with Ashley. Um, he was just a regular guy from upstate New York, so I kind of could relate to him. He just spoke um, uh, extemporaneously. And um, I have my notes here. He said, uh, you know, we all know how horrible the situation in Gaza is, but in the West Bank, he said in 30 years working in war zones, nothing could have prepared him for what ha has happened after October right. 7th in East Jerusalem. He evacuated his uh, wife and children. So they've been in the United States. He stayed on, of course, that's his job. He said, um, and I quote, every Israeli is a soldier ready to kill. Uh, this is an urban military assault that's happening in the West Bank. Uh, Israelis are out for blood. And as we know, uh, our government has helped to supply settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem with, with weapons. These people uh, uh, are violent, they're, they're terrifying, and they act with impunity. Uh, and, and in fact, they become rock stars if they uh, kill Palestinians. Um, just the, the discussion by Adam Belokas about um, the cutting of UNRWA and how Interestingly, um, the International Court of Justice released its findings on January 26th, I believe it was, um, saying that, yes, there's we believe there's a plausible um, genocide happening in Gaza and it and Israel needs to stop. That word starts to spread throughout the world. And two days later, on January 28th, Israel says, guess what? 12 out of 11, thousands, 000. over 100,000 UNRWA employees are Hamas operatives and were involved on October 7th. This is classic, uh, classic Israeli. It's called Hasbara or their narrative or they're spinning the story. And as the saying goes, the, the truth, the, uh, 
lies can get around the world five times before the truth can put its pants on. And we have since found out that um, Israel, the IDF, took uh, captives de and detained them, men from Gaza, and um, they, they uh, forced confessions with torture, um, threats, forced confessions were gotten out of them. And so there you go. There's your um, Hamas operatives. It's all Thank a pack of lies. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that uh, that was a powerful part of his presentation to us. Susan? Yeah, I don't have a lot to add. Um, I, I, <clears throat> again, I'm going through my notes and um, I over 100 UNRWA employees have been killed. Um, they're being shot at. Um, they're being shot at in the West Bank, um, not just being killed in, in Gaza. Uh, aside from bombing their facilities and um, in Gaza, they're taking over the idea. The Israeli militia is taking over UNRWA facilities and shooting at Palestinians from the UNRWA facilities. So I've been doing a little bit more reading on what what's going on there. And um, so the that I picked up recently. Um, the other thing is that I remember hearing is that Israel has been trying to get rid of UNRWA for a really long time. And so there, this kind of plays into their desire to get rid of UNRWA. So they they claim that these twelve people were Hamas operatives or whatever, even and were with UNRWA out of thousands of people, and then gets the UK and all the other countries in the United States to to immediately shut down. I mean, I think that comes back to the U.S. war. What we talked about earlier, you know, the 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 UN um, vetoes, uh, all that stuff um, that's going on with U.S. government and U.S. policy. The U.S. had no evidence. There's no evidence yet. There's no physical evidence other than what um, Joanne mentioned about being tortured. Of any, and they're not providing the UN with any evidence of any people being part of Hamas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the U the U the US just immediately knee jerk reaction. We're going to stop funding, and without any justification. Ashley and jo thank you, Susan. Ashley and Joanne, let me ask you. Uh, in addition to visiting with uh, and walking around uh, Hebron with Isa Amro, which was powerful, right? It was powerful. We were able to spend a, a few minutes outside on the street with the CPTers, the Community Peacemaker Team folks. Uh, you wanna say a brief word about our time with them uh, on the street, Ashley and Joanne? Go ahead, Joanne, then Ashley. Yeah, yeah. it was um, uh, an abbreviated meeting and we were just all standing in the street. Um, there are young uh, women, and I think there was one young man with them, and they um, just described what they do um, as part of, it. the name used to be Christian Peacemaker Teams, and now I think they, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, they uh, changed their name to Community Peacemaker Teams, yeah, and um, yeah, it's just uh, support, solidarity, you know, bearing witness, trying to be um, a, a uh, buffer um, against the violence of this military occupation, which is really, really uh, amplified in, in Hebron. They were impressive. One thing I noticed um, in past visits, um, the Christian peacemaker teams we visited with, it was a, a lot of um, you know Europeans like, like us who spent time in the West Bank. Um, doing the work, but um, now uh, they seem to be more local Palestinian uh, young right. people who who are working with them. That's right, yeah. Ashley. Thanks, Joanne. Yeah, I mean the work that they do um, is is impressive um, in the midst of a really like you know horrific situation, and they do a lot of accompaniment, um, as I'm sure. Probably many of the folks on this uh, call already know. Um, in Hebron, you have a very small number of uh, illegal settlers, Israeli settlers, who are living in the middle of a large Palestinian community. Um, but 
folks who live like alongside that settlement, um, their life has been completely shut down um, and they can't walk on the streets. They can't go out the front doors of their homes. Um, you know, everything is constrained and, and their life has been, you know, just completely uh, blockaded in many ways by um, by the settlement there. And so, for example, children who walk to school often have to go to several checkpoints um, and, you know, and ch even children um, are treated poorly um, by the military. Um, and um, as Jack mentioned with the, the kid on the bike, um, they sometimes like to, you know, poke at them a little bit, too. And there's sometimes a very strange relationship things that happen because, um, you know, they, they know each other. They see each other every day sometimes. And um, but notwithstanding, oftentimes children are taken um, and the parents don't know where they've been they've been taken to. And so the peacemaker team uh, often accompanies those children, walks with them, tries to make sure that they move through those checkpoints safely. Um, and of course, as Palestinians doing that work, it's one thing if you have, you know, uh, foreigners, if you will, coming over and, and internationals coming and standing alongside people and doing that work, although increasingly those folks were denied entry um, into, um, you know, into Israel, Palestine. But but when you're local and you're doing that work, when you're Palestinian doing that work, you know, the risk is so much higher um, yeah, for you as well. And so so that work is just so, um, it, you know, it's it's the the fact that they're doing that work um, is just so impressive because it's it is a risk to their own to their own life as well as you know. Yeah, and, and as we were and as we were uh, visiting with them, of course, that's when the settler parade, the Shabbat settler parade, took place. And of course, whenever you have one settler, you have uh, uh, two or three, you have two or three soldiers for every right. every settler. Uh, Susan and, and Jack, I know you want to weigh in too on this, and maybe you can weave it into your answer, but I, I want to, uh, I'm aware of the time and I want to make sure we get a couple of more questions in. We've also visited with uh, um, uh, Sahar Francis from Adamir in Ramallah. And I want to say hello to Ashley, to Cedar Duebus, because uh, we visited with Salwa, her daughter, and Gerard Horton from military court watch in Ramallah. And I guess, Susan and Jack, I'd like for you to weigh in a little bit on what we heard about night raids and child prisoners and uh, the military courts. That's, um, that's being stepped up to now, isn't it? Yes. Susan. Yeah. I mean, I'm sitting on the edge of my seat, you know, here, I just, you know, one of the things with the CPT group is that they, they, they're there for children and children, and this ties in with the military, the military court watch and um, uh, Adamir is that, you know, there, there's a lot of focus on children here because of the, tr the massive amount of trauma uh, um, on children. When we were with Sam, Sam Bahir in, in um, Sam Bahor in, um, in uh, Ramallah, he was talking about the night raids. They've, they've increased exponentially the night raids. There's night raids every day, every, every night day. in Ramallah. And they're taking people from all ages, including children, and they're putting them in administrative detention. And we heard about administrative detention from the other military watch people. And military detention, um, sorry, Administrative detention is just you grab somebody, you throw them in jail, and they're they're not tried. There, there's no trial. There's no there's no accusations. It's just they're put in as a security risk, and they're stuck in jail for months, years, and every six months they get um uh they're they're told they they're they're in jail for six months, and then they get reevaluated every six months, and they can either be let go or they get another six months. So they can be in year in 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 prison for ten years. Some of the adults, some of the um, the minors, the children get into administrative detention, and they're in there for. They can be in solitary confinement. They can be in all kinds of issues. The Israelis will take them out of school. They'll take them out of their beds at night. Um, and it's just it's just horrific what they're doing to the children. And a good film, one of the guys on our trip is Joshua Vies, and he put a documentary together called the, the Law and the Prophets. You've got to see this this documentary. It shows a Palestinian child in detention being questioned by the Israeli military. And they just it's it's torture for these kids. Absolute torture. I, I don't know what else to call it. And we're letting this happen. We're, and we're complicit in it happening. We're, we're paying for it to happen. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Jack? 
Um, I, you know, I don't know if there's much to add. Susan covered it really well. Um, it's, I, it's Gerard, right? Yeah. Um, military court watch. We saw them also in 2019. Um, and one of the points that struck me the most, uh, listening to him then and now, uh, was the fact that it's a little hard for Americans to, uh, for the U S government to say, Hey, uh, China, you're, <laughs> you're not following international law when, uh, we're not following international law in regard to Israel. Um, he he was noting not so much the hypocrisy of that, but how much it undercuts just the justice system in, internationally. Um, so that that was that was really hard. I um, I don't know. It's you know I I'm sort of like Susan. I'm you just feel like crying. Um, you know you're, you're right, Jack. You know we go ahead. I'm sorry, please. I mean these the kids are getting. I mean, you know, I can't imagine me sitting in my bed and then suddenly soldiers bursting in through my door and taking my five-year-old kid or my 10-year-old kid or whatever and not knowing where they're going to go and, um, you know, and having soldiers with automatic weapons scream at them uh, and then put a, as Gerard said, put a, you know, put a mask over their head and drive them around in a truck for five or six hours to disorient them um i mean it's and then and then go to prison um the other thing that strikes me there is that he talked about this and it, i mean it's no no surprise uh there's a uh, without evidence there's a 95 to 99 percent conviction rate um yeah. i mean it's not you know it's not like it's a justice system uh, right you know, uh, you mentioned this, that Gerard really, uh, really emphasized this. It's not only that the U.S. has lost all of its credibility when it talks. They kept saying, don't talk to us anymore, you in the West, about human rights or yeah. international law. It's not only that we've lost our credibility, but it's the, the undercutting of the whole framework of international law, right, and of human yeah. rights yeah. law. Yes. I've got a and couple he, more. I, Go ahead, Jack. He specifically talked about the fact that, you know, in, in 10 years, you're going to have to deal with China dealing with this uh, yeah. and you won't have a leg to stand on. I've got just a couple yeah. more questions because I'm aware of the time. I mean, I've got about eight more questions, but uh, I'll, I'll get to a couple of them here. I, I want to go back to the Western churches because, because, I mean, we were 23 church leaders and activists. And I, each one of our denominations has Palestine Israel networks, right? Pin groups, our activist groups within the denomination. Uh, I, I, even even the denominations that have been out in front on this issue, and and you know we can name them, but there's more that can be done. Uh, I think we could all all agree on that from the Western Church. Where are our sisters and brothers in Christ and the Western Church speaking on our behalf? Munther Isaac, Sammy Awad went off. I mean, this is a peace-loving, Gandhi-esque figure, and he went off on Christian Zionists, right? I mean, I've never heard Sammy so angry before. And, and their message that we kept hearing was not just come and see, go and tell, which is what we've heard in the past, but now it's come and see, go and tell, and act. And I guess if any, if any of you want to weigh in again on on what we in the church, in the Western church, need to be about. Uh, we talked about it earlier, but maybe I thought you'd want to add to what we said earlier. Uh, Joanne? Yeah, um, I, I'm i not very active. I'm a kind of a lapsed Catholic, um, but nevertheless, it formed me and my, uh, it is, uh, the Sermon on the Mount is um, the guidepost for my life. Um, I, I, I don't know how to turn around the whole Christian Zionist mindset. Um, it seems to be a package deal and I, I feel like we just need to get a wedge in there. Um, Josh, this is, uh, documentary was so superb and, um, I'm at work now. Uh, and, um, so I, I can't talk freely at work 
about all this, but I have colleagues who are members of uh, Josh Viss's congregation. I think it's called Reform Church of America. It yeah. comes from the Dutch Reform Church. So I, I feel, I, I just, I just, I can't do big things. I can only um, try to get through to one person at a time. It's, it's yeah. the little way of St. Therese of Lisieux. And um, so that film I am sharing with a colleague of mine who is a very active member of that church. And it's pure facts, pure facts. Um, and that's what we need to do is speak the truth. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, Ashley? So we have yeah, a, a, um, we go from a good Catholic girl to a good Baptist girl here. <laughs> um. You know, yeah, the 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 silence of the church has been um, deafening, as many people have said. And I think um, the, you know, I, I mean, there's a lot of people who are doing amazing work. You know, the church, frankly, needs to open its eyes and get on board with the people who are doing the work already. Um, we don't have to, like, reinvent the wheel if you, you know, we want to put it in, like that, use that phrase. Um, there are amazing folks who are organizing. A lot of them come out of our churches, frankly, and they're not attending our churches because they don't see our churches as relevant to the world. Um, folks who, in Jewish Voice for Peace, and if not now, and, um, and, 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 and some of the you know, amazing organizers that are like things that are happening here in Boston. Today, I was looking at the uh, an agenda for a Good Friday action that's going to happen, and literally, I'm I'm looking at them. They're doing a they're they're putting together a liturgy for Good Friday, you know. And the people who I'm commenting, or I see the, who are making these comments and are putting you know commenting on this liturgy, and they're making ideas. I don't think they go to a church. <laughs> And frankly, they're, they're they're fabulous, like litanies and liturgies about, you know, what does it mean? And it's 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 straight Christian stuff, let me tell you. And they are following Jesus, and but they're not in our churches. And the churches need to open their eyes and get outside the building, and get outside our own little power hungry silos, and and follow people doing the work. Thank you, Ashley. You know, and it strikes me too. We in the mainline like to pick on Christian Zionists because they're low hanging fruit, right? I mean, they're easy pickings. But the progressive churches, the progressive churches, right? Uh, they they've been equally complicit with their silence because they don't want to offend. Susan, yeah, I'm a Catholicarian. I'm a lapsed Catholic going to a Presbyterian church now. <laughs> <laughs> I I uh I do my part. I mean, I do what I can. I I speak up in my church. We're a small church. Um I think I've had an impact on my church. I'm trying to have an impact on the presbytery itself. Um I'm I'm working with other, you know, people in the in the area, Methodist churches and and such. So I mean, I, I feel like I'm just this little, you know, little person, little voice in the wind, but at least it's something, you know, I, I feel like it's like the the kid on the, on the beach with a, with a starfish, you know, throwing yeah. in a starfish at a time. Um, I'm, I am disturbed though, by some of the, uh, even though the Presbyterians, I'm very happy have done things like um, uh, uh, divested. Um, but then there's a lot of people in the presbytery who say that people that are pushing for those kinds of things are uh, extremists. And so it, there's just there's a huge, very strong, you know, lobby for Israel. And it's it's prevalent and it's it's hard to it's hard to to um, combat. Yeah. Christian Zionism is is not only a phenomenon in the religious right, right? It's also present in the mainline churches. Yeah, Jack, a, a, an Episcopal, an Episcopalian boy. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd say um, Jesus was an extremist. You don't get nailed for uh, just being pamby pamby. Um, I think one of the things that strikes me is that uh, being convicted by um the Palestinian folks we met in 2019 and in and this this meeting here. We went to the House of Hope, which is in Bethany, 
uh, it's a, a Palestinian school. Uh, the kindergarten teacher there who, who runs a school, helps run the school, sent her kid out to get um, lemons out of her backyard. And uh, the kid came back with munitions from um, the US. Uh, they've got a bowl of them in the school, uh, all these munitions. So we ask her, um, I mean, how do you deal with this day after day after day? Um, and she I mean, she was great. I mean, she just said, I wash and I wash and I wash every time I go to sleep. Um, and I, I, that just helped me tremendously in terms of saying, okay, um, I get, I get really down on what's going on. Uh, I get depressed and, and despairing. And yet if uh, somebody who's under that veil, under that threat can wash and wash and wash, it's the least I can do to do the same. Um, I look to, um, I, I, I guess I feel it's, um, I'm just not very potent in what I'm doing, but uh, just to keep going is is really important. And one of the things we'll do is talk to our bishops um, that are, we're connected with three dioceses here. We'll talk to our bishops uh, and we'll, we'll keep uh, connecting with our, our, uh, our groups that are doing action here. One of those is really supportive and really inspiring. And that's the um, Bishop's Committee for Peace and Justice in the Holy Land in Western Washington and the Diocese of Olympia. And they they do great work. They have a film a film study. Uh, we've seen great films from them. So that's uh, one of the things that sort of inspires me as well. So and I'll leave Bishop it at that. Committee was one of our sponsors uh, for yep. the delegation. Doug Thorpe is part of that. Yep. 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 Uh, my last question then before we close is uh, one of the the second part of our. The second part of our uh, delegation was to return to Washington, D.C. And uh, just uh, anything that you took part in in Washington, D.C. that you'd like to share, any any particular action or demonstration or interface service or, uh, or a, a congressional meeting that you'd like to share. Uh, uh, let's, let's start with you, Jack. Um. I, I was just inspired by Jen Hosler, uh, her her activism and her organizing the uh, of the uh, demonstration we did along with others, many others. Um, that was um, I don't know it, and it. I guess the other thing that struck me there is looking at all these massive buildings, and you realize I mean we're I feel like we're sort of throwing gravel at these massive buildings to try and get anything done. Uh, but that being said, uh, the protest was wonderful. Uh, the other thing that uh, struck me was going to see our Senator Jeff Merkley, who's turned um, in Oregon. He's turned like not a not a great deal, but he's he's gone from sort of being mamby pamby to speaking out, and it was uh, it was great to be with him, uh, with his staff, and uh, just hear that they're they're on board. Good, good. Thanks, Jack. Susan? Um, I had a an interesting, I, I didn't get any uh, one-on-ones with anybody in my, in that, in my, um, my representatives, um, but I did walk into one senator's office. Uh, she's the one that uh, is taking over for Diane Feinstein. And as I walked in, one of her staff members was on the phone taking notes and saying, okay, you want a ceasefire. Okay, you want to refund UNRWA. And I thought, oh, wow, the only one. I just felt so good. So I um, so I then started talking to another staff member and I said, I'm here to say the exact same thing. And, you know, I, I actually gave her our report, even though it wasn't quite uh, as cleaned up as it could have been. But I didn't know what else to give her. But I wanted to give her something to um know that you know what the point of my being there was and that we need to stop this so that 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 felt good um my my representative rokana has not been as receptive as i would like but he is changing his position slightly um so we're thankful for that but uh we'd like him to be a leader which he's not yet 
Thanks, Susan. Uh, Joanne? Yeah. Um, well, I should preface this by saying I, I do not believe we live in a democracy anymore, or if we ever did. Um, the polls show that well over something like 60% of uh, U.S. citizens uh, believe that we should not be supporting Israel and should not be sending them weapons and uh, we should uh, force a ceasefire. Um, I met, I'm from Wash, I'm from Seattle, I, so Washington State, so I met uh, with a group of us, uh, Maria Cantwell and Patty Murray, are our senators, and, um, you know, I would, was the umpteenth time I've met with um, these folks over the years. Um, nothing really changes. Um, you get a nice thank you email and yeah, we'll take this all under consideration and then they just go on with their um, pro-Israel policies. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's important to, to kind of rub their nose in it. And um, uh, these folks, who um, are are not calling for an end to the genocide and and the uh, violence and colonial takeover uh, by Israel? They, it's on the record, and they can't take it back. Uh, we know where they stand, and they're not going to be on the right side of history. And what's going to change all this is what happens every weekend in the streets of Seattle, London, New York. LA, all over the world, righteous people are out demanding justice and and that's what's gonna work. Um, so let's just keep doing it. Ashley? Well, I second that um, comment. And, you know, I think uh, that for me, the moment um, in DC that was really um, uh, just the most meaningful was when, um, Congresswoman Rashida Talab came to our the interfaith service and spoke and um, and you could see how meaningful it was for her um, personally um, to feel the support um, to feel like she's you know not uh, she's got to have felt very alone um, as she has stood alone so many times um, and uh, just that was really significant for me to to see that and to be able to be there in that moment. Um, you know, so how can we also continue to support the people who are doing the really hard work of, of standing up, you know, in Congress and in front of their colleagues um, and, and, and speaking out for the truth? So in addition to kind of continuing to pester, um, to pester uh, those folks who say they represent us uh, to do what is right. Uh, you know, Ashley, um, we tend to focus on the folks that we do need to pester, but I'm so glad, I'm so glad that you raised that last point because the folks who are doing the right thing, they're under lots of pressure, aren't they? And so we need to stand with them and let them know that, let them know that there are people who support them and that are grateful, people who are grateful for their mm -hmm. votes on the right side of the angels, right? I mean, she's not my rep in Massachusetts, but she's my rep, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, I, uh, I'm i going to give each one of you uh, a, a, a last word uh, that you'd like to share, but I, I want to just say a few more things. Uh, tomorrow, for those of you on the call who are members of the United Church of Christ, four members of our delegation who are members of the UCC, um, uh, I'm going to be in conversation with them at one o'clock Eastern time. And uh, the link is on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace Facebook page and website. So again, that's tomorrow, United Church of Christ members of the Stones Cry Out delegation, one o'clock tomorrow. And the link, the Zoom link is on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace Facebook page and, and website. Number two. We kept hearing two names, right? Aaron Bushnell and Rachel Corey. And of course, just this last Saturday, March 16th, 21 years. It's been 21 years already that we lost Rachel Corey, murdered by a soldier, an Israeli soldier on a caterpillar bulldozer in Rafa, in Rafa. Aaron Bushnell and Rachel Corey. And as you said, Joanne and Susan, we need to say their names, and we did. 
Um, number three, uh, the report says Zionism is a force of destruction, that it's a racist settler colonial project that must be rejected out of hand and dismantled so that a system of government based on equality, human dignity, and full civil, political, and human rights will be created. So we're battling not just Benjamin Netanyahu or, you know, some Israeli politicians, but it's a systemic, Jack, you used the word before, it's a systemic Zionist, civil, religious, right? Politically religious, Ooh. religiously political uh, 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 effort. So uh, uh, we want to keep calling that out. Zionism is a settler colonial project. Uh, I want to call your attention to uh, our report that is mentioned uh, in the chat up near the front. And then finally, I just want to mention before I turn it back over to you all, that uh, I had a phone call about an hour ago from Dawood. And uh, he they had a special meeting of Friends of Tenta Nations, I know. And uh, uh, but Dawood reports that uh, there was a new road built by the Israelis uh, just to the east of his property that now runs through parts of the property of Tenth of Nations. And he used terms like it's it the uh, the situation is escalating. The situation is escalating, and we felt it there. I want to just repeat for because many of you on this call have been to Tent of Nations and no doubt. Um, 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 we felt the tension as these armed settlers walked with impunity through the farm. And I'm just wondering if we had not been there or if the other international man who was helping him wouldn't have been there. We just wonder what might have happened to Daoud and Daher and Amal Nassar that day. So we really want to stand with Daoud. And for those of you in the Washington, D.C. area, Daoud will be in Washington, D.C. April 9th to 19th for the Churches for Middle East Peace Days of Action there. So with that, uh, Joanne, uh, would you want to have any closing words? And then we'll go to Ashley and Jack and then Susan. Well, I think the best close, closing words are uh, Jesus's words, um, the Beatitudes. Um, blessed are the poor, blessed are the sick, blessed are the imprisoned. Um, and uh, we just have to keep uh fighting for what's right and uh never never stop thank you joanne uh, and thank you for all that you do in washington thank you <laughs> ashley um just want to encourage us to continue uh, especially those of us uh in you know progressive liberal um churches um, to look at the ways that um, that our communities perpetuate uh, Christian Zionism. If you haven't yet read Mitri's new book, uh, Decolonizing Palestine, he talks a lot about that. And uh, it's not just about what we believe, but it's about what we do. Um, and I think that that's going to require some risk on our part. It's going to work and it might, you know, it, it might cause some tension. It might um, it might create a little uh, little trouble. Um, but I think that part of taking up our cross uh, in the season of Lent uh, and as Christians is that we need to be willing uh, to stand for what's right, um, you know, and and there are consequences to that. And I think we need to to really continue to struggle with that and, uh, and try to live in that and live in that way. So I appreciate everybody here today. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Jack? Jack, please. I, you know, it's, um, I think one of the things that happens for me is I get discouraged as we, you know, we enumerate all the horrors that are happening, the system, the, uh, and all the injustice and, and all the death. Um, and I, I get overwhelmed by that. Um, 
And yet, uh, I think one of the things that's it's helpful to be in a group like we were in uh, Palestine and and be inspired by other folks. Um, I get inspired by uh, just trying to turn inward and say, okay, how how would the spirit be moving me in a direction that would that would help these folks and not just uh, continue to bemoan the fact that uh, things are horrible. Um, I'm inspired by um, our guy Desmond Tutu, uh, and realized you know it took years for him to um, to keep going, and yet he continued to come back to his spiritual base and uh, and like Joanne said, uh, fall back on the beatitudes and go from there. Um, I I want to continue to keep brainstorming ways to sort of. Um, I, I don't know who it was. One of the folks that we met with said it's, you know, politics is about interests. You got to figure out uh, a way that these folks can get interested in doing the right thing. Um, so those are the things that I want to try and figure out. I, I think of an example of a person we met in 2019 who um, he was, he was pissed about the, uh, the settlers taking over and, uh, and uh, underwriting the demolition of uh, houses. And so he's attacked the uh, NGO status of those groups in the United States and began uh, lobbying in that regard. So I'm gonna try and find out, find ways that I can I can um, do better than uh, just sticking my finger in the dike and hoping it quits leaking. Thank you, Jack, and greetings to uh, Christy, okay? Thanks. Uh, Susan. She's right. <laughs> Susan. Um, I often get the question, why Palestine? Why am I interested in Palestine? Why do I why do I work, you know, for Palestinian rights? And my my aunt, you know, they say, Are you Palestinian or do you have family in Palestine? And I was like, No, I am following like what Jesus said, right? You you have to be a peacemaker, but it's more than that. There are so many issues on the, in the on the planet. There are issues of oppression all over the planet. But let's focus on what we in the United States can do and how can we have an impact on global peace? I believe, and actually Janet and I were talking about this when we were there in, in Bethlehem, that this issue is so massive that if we could collectively resolve this issue, it could have such a huge impact on world peace, uh, particularly in the Middle East. And if we would pay attention to our US policies on the international stage, and we could uh, see how we are looked at as pariahs, as liars, as um, people who just- Ponies phonies, talk out both sides of your mouth. This is the one core place that that issue is, is so exposed. You know, the United States' is, hypocrisy is exposed. And not only that, I mean, let's look at just how this affects us internally in the United States. First of all, it's our dollars are paying for all of this. Number two, the, the Palestinians, Native Americans, and African Americans have a very similar um, issue. Native Americans have been decimated. There's been genocide. They've been pushed off their land and they're not being given any, they can't go back to their own land. They can't go back to their homes. This has been going on for hundreds of years. Um, we give them no reparations. We give them very little in terms of reparations. I mean, they're, the, the problems on, on Native American lands are just horrible. African Americans are being treated and killed in our streets, and they're being trained by Israeli military. They use the same tactics as the Israelis use on um, Palestinians that they train on Palestinians, and then we use them here in the United States. We need to be in the United States. We need to be aware of the full situation. If we want peace, then we need to understand the history. We need to understand how we are complicit and we need to understand where our tax dollars are going. 
And the only way we're going to do that is we educate, 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 and we open minds and try to make sure that people really understand the truth. And that's what my goal is, is because I think it would have a huge impact on world peace. Great. Thank you so much for that, Susan. Thanks to all of you. I'll just I'll just uh, say that, uh, Susan, you brought up something that is an integral part of the conversation that we really didn't emphasize enough today, and that is how Christian exceptionalism, you know, white Christian exceptionalism, white Jewish exceptionalism, Zionism, has this has this racist underbelly, right? And yes. so the, the the racist aspect of this we really didn't talk about enough, but you're connecting with the indigenous peoples of this land and the uh, 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 our, our other people of color in the United States, whether it's on the Southern border or Black Lives Matter or others, such an important connection to make. And that's worthy of a, a conversation all on its own. The last thing I'll say is that the planning group is planning to get together again. And so all of you, not only those of you who are part of this delegation, but also the rest of you who are on this call and all across the United States, you'll be uh, you'll be hearing more from us in the days to come about where we're going from here. Joanne, it looked like you wanted to say something. Yeah, just a one final word uh, that we forgot to bring up um, on the topic of racism, Michael. Um, it it was noted, and uh, nobody has to tell us. Compare and contrast the U.S. response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine to uh, Israel's uh, uh, invasion of, of Gaza and, and the deaths. Uh, and there's only one conclusion you can make. Um, your racism is showing, so. Thanks so much for that, Joanne, so important.